Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Curian. I am a medical oncologist at St. Elizabeth's Healthcare in Edgewood, Kentucky. Um, I am a breast cancer specialist, um, and I'll introduce yourself as well, Tara. And I'm Carissa Britton. I am a breast oncologist and clinical investigator at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. Perfect. Well, thanks for being here of as well, Tara. And so I think the, the hot topic, I think, you know, with um, everything we've seen, you know, recently at ESMO and then building upon that here at San Antonio is um, the five-year Natalie right. data as well. Too. Absolutely. Tell me about your initial impressions from yep. the data and, and what you think regarding it. It's really exciting, the kind of changing landscape of CDK4-6 inhibitors, particularly in the adjuvant setting. Um, so as you, of course, know, the initial phase three Natalie results were published in 2024, um, showing at first just uh, an improvement in both invasive disease-free survival and distant disease-free survival. Sure. We, of course, did not have any overall survival data at that time. Um, a few months later, we had uh, FDA approval. And that was really exciting in the breast oncology world because, of course, leading up to that, we only had Monarch E. Definitely. And so adding kind of a new CDK4-6 inhibitor with a different dosing regimen, a different side, side effect profile to our um, kind of arsenal of medications in the adjuvant setting was um, really exciting. Um, the kind of introduction of ribocyclib outside of the metastatic setting. Um, and, um, of course, you know that then more recently, just within the last couple of months at ESMO, um, we did, uh, kind of get a glimpse into some of the overall survival data, um, both for Monarchy, for abemocyclib, and for, um, Natalie, for ribocyclib. Um, and, um, that also has been very exciting for us in the breast cancer world, because I think... Initially, when we first saw the Natalie data, and we didn't have that same overall survival data, um, a lot of clinicians were a little bit hesitant. We had kind of more mature data from Monarchy for abemocyclib in the adjuvant setting. Um, and we at least had a little bit of an overall survival signal at that time. And so in the last year and a half or so since Natalie was published, many of us have really still been using um, ribocyclib only for patients who maybe were no negative, so didn't fit into the inclusion criteria sure. or monarch E, or um, maybe for uh, patients who, for uh, other reasons, like could not tolerate a bemocyclib maybe because of that side effect profile. Um, and so I think getting that overall survival data at ESMO was really um, kind of the extra boost of confidence that we needed to be able to prescribe that medication and feel a little bit more comfortable than we had. Yes. Um, the metastatic setting is, uh, you know, a little bit of a different story. We, of course, have much longer term survival data from the Mona Lisa trials. And so I think we feel very comfortable prescribing ribocyclib in the first line setting there. Um, I think there are still some questions that haven't been answered. Um, you know, for me personally, I, I do wonder if just from a broader clinical trials perspective, if maybe it's time in, in that adjuvant setting, in the early stage setting for us to move away from some of our kind of older um, uh, uh, outcomes. Um, should we still be looking at overall survival in the adjuvant setting as, yes. as our kind of primary endpoint for these studies or even a secondary endpoint? Is disease-free survival, progression-free survival, these are meaningful endpoints, and are they enough for us to kind of feel comfortable prescribing those medications now? Correct. And I, and I do bring, you, you bring up a very good point in the sense of that these are traditional endpoints we've used for a very long time. They're surrogates, right? So we know that IDFS is a surrogate, you know, for overall survival in the sense that these trials will take years Correct. to follow up in right. terms of knowing if there's an overall survival. And I remind folks that the Natalie was not power mm -hmm. for overall survival as well too that it is an important point to make that we can you know cross trial compare between sure the two you know because they're uh, different patient populations number one and then you know the the way that they were designed statistically were very different exactly. as well too so that creates a you know a conundrum for clinicians you know like you and i are sitting in the clinic and looking at someone and saying this person may meet both criteria how do we make that decision sure. is the harder question right. to answer as well too yeah but i do think that you know natalie is definitely something that you know seeing the the five-year you know idfs data i think was very meaningful to me as well too and i think that you know uh, rightfully seeing you know the abema data and the Earl Wolf survival really told us that the story of cdk 46 inhibitors is that we are doing the right thing right. for patients exactly. in the sense of that we are preventing recurrences of those folks. Correct. And it has 
IDFS and it has over a survive it as well too. So I think that that's the take home message I, I tell people is that, you know, we, we always want to be sure with, we knew we needed a longer term follow up for these studies as well. And I think that that was something that we couldn't get till five years out. Right. So we waited a long time for, for this data and seven years out for the event data, but I do think having this data makes us, should reassure us that we feel comfortable with that approach. Exactly. I agree.